Okay, this might be the last the last video of the day. This is Jeremiah. He is on fire. Um, we have one desire, and that's to bless the Lord and to speak uh, 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 good words to the Lord and hallow, hallowed it be thy name and so that we can speak the name in righteousness as we cleanse ourselves of all unrighteousness through the power and the force of the Lord and his guidance and his intelligence to, to get us out of all the filth that's out there. And uh, we're going to bless the Lord in these circumstances and he's going to be very happy and uh and all of our all of the springs of joy are in the lord we we uh we want to please father and that's our goal here and when he's happy we're happy if he's not happy we're not happy that they had a christian comedian on tv the other day that said mama wasn't happy so she said nobody else could be happy. <laughs> a very good comedian uh, on, the, on the web there, of one of these uh, no drinking establishments, which uh, I, used, I, I used to watch a little bit of that, but Jeremiah's on fire here. We're rejoicing in the Lord with you. Okay, we're, we're rejoicing in the coming of our Lord. My soul waits for the Lord and the blessed hope of his coming. We greet you in the only name given amongst men by which you must be saved. And you come to the name and you knelt to the man who owns that name, and which is the son of man, Jesus Christ, the son of Mary. And you have given your life to him and you are rejoicing together with me in all of this glory of his grace. God is shining his color and his light on you, and it's in reference to what you can't deserve. It's not of yourself. It's a gift of God that you can't earn. But he does demand love and appreciation in general, and that's what he told Peter. I, you know, I've commanded you to work. I didn't command you to be perfect. I didn't command you to work perfectly. I didn't command you to do that, but I did command you to hold the office in general. And that office is, is the office of the gift of the Holy Spirit, which you owned, uh, a piece of God is in you, and work it, dude, to put it in American terminology. Love is work. I mentioned this a thousand times in this ministry that my parents showed me what love is. Love is not a, a, a lip service. Uh, love is a lot of work and a lot of activity and it's also sacrifice, big time. I, I saw some movie star children on television here the other day, and they told me they never knew their parents. They were always on the road making money and hitting the road. They never knew their children. Now, we're not saying it's all bad because they were earn, earning lots of money uh, for the children. But the bottom line is uh, uh, children don't just need money. They need your presence. The, 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 the daughter of a famous soccer star, the daughter of a famous boxer, and I knew the daughter of a famous soul singer. She said that she never saw her dad once or twice a year. Point being, uh, I didn't get that. I got the opposite of that. My parents gave up all stardom, all lights, all extra monies just for me. They could have probably gotten out there and done well in in Babylon, in Tinseltown or something. Who knows? They, they weren't going to find out taking care of me 24 hours a day, were they? No. So I know what love is. I've experienced it. And once you know what real love is, like agape kind of love, intelligent, consistent, you, 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 won't, you won't put up with anybody playing games with your affections and so forth. You'll, you'll ask them to leave. Now, you'll, you'll work with them in the church and so forth, but as far as having a close relationship, it ain't going to happen. No soap. 
Why? Because you know what real care is. I used to watch the uh, Jerry Springer show every now and then, and the people on there, some of the women and even the men would say, I love Cindy even though she's violent, she won't work, she won't clean, and she has other relations and so forth. And that's called not good love. That's not love. That's not what it is. It's affection. Love demands discipline. Real, you know, the real deal, Holyfield. You know. you know, you can't tell me that you really care about me and you, and you go around the corner and you try to put me down and, and you do things to uh, damage my progress or so, so, something along those lines. And, and I've run into that quite a bit in my life, and some of you have. It's very uncomfortable, but it's a part of life. Now, when you get to heaven, those people will not be there. The only people that are in heaven are people who really understood and really wanted to be real agape people. Well, they're not perfect at agape. Uh, you don't have to be perfect at loving people. That's not my point. This is a very big part of Christianity, by the way. And it takes us back to what? Category number one. Now let's finally get to Psalm 21 here. Now, we're going to get into things that are going to happen to David that are, are going to make him happy. He's very happy. And he's happy because of quite a few things. He's a, he's, he, he is a shepherd boy who is very happy with being a shepherd boy. He didn't mind protecting the sheep from very dangerous animals. He's very brave, this gentleman. However, he's also very emotional. We can see that. In spite of being brave, he's also quite human in, in terms of uh, having fears and so forth. That's my point. I left off the last video talking about the police officer who came over to my house and I saluted him and, and basically, basically telling him, thank you for your service. That police officer is a real man. He's willing to lay down his life for other people, which is quite obvious. He doesn't have to do that. He could go around the corner, and he, he, he can get a, a kickback job, so to speak, and, and eat ice cream every night and, and, and preserve himself in a much more uh, favorable condition. He, he knows that he has entered into a dangerous zone, of some sort, somewhat of an American soldier, but he doesn't mind doing that. So that officer is to be honored based upon that position. But it, it, it's not worship, though. And, and, and a lot of people will have confusion in this area. We don't have confusion in the Protestant church in this area. That's why it's so valuable to be a Protestant. Protestantism basically was born in the United States of America. It was developed in the United States of America. The most intelligent group of human beings that have ever existed uh, basically started and lived and still do live in the United States of America since, since uh, Moses and through all time. Even more intelligent than Moses and Aaron and, and Enoch maybe and... Uh, Daniel, everybody. Why? Because knowledge increased at the end of the world. Knowledge increased with William Penn bringing a Bible to a state of 13 colonies where he was teaching high intelligence with the Bible. Well, there, there you have it. That's why America is America. Because of the Bible. That's what makes America uh, aggrandized over the rest of the world, because they embrace truth. If you embrace truth, you've embraced God. If you embrace God, your circumstances are going to be more favorable than the people around the corner who are embracing lies. The circumstances in Haiti, the circumstances in Peru, where they shrink humans' heads and, and, they, and they laugh about it as being something profitable. If you shrink someone's head or something, we're not going to get into the details. I'm making a quick point that the reason why uh, your, your circumstances are favorable is because you decided to put truth on. 
And if you put truth on, you're going to probably find your circumstances much better off than if you embrace lies. Because it's a reproach. The Bible says that sin is a reproach to anybody or any group of people. That's the point. It'd be much better, you'd be much better off joining the Amish people over here than going to a Jerry Springer hotel and taking drugs as a decision, as an, as an adult. You, you can choose either one. You can go over there to the Amish people, or you can go over to the drug crowd over there at the hotel. Which, which, uh, which, which crowd do you want to live in? Now, I'm talking to the adults right now, basically, and, and, and uh, the wise choice is to go over to the Amish people big time. Because you're going to teach the truth, you're going to embrace the truth, you're going to get God's attention, and that, uh, that ain't hey. Okay? Now let's, get, now let's finally get to 21 here. The king shall join in thy strength, O Lord, and in thy salvation, how greatly shall he rejoice. So now we're getting into the power of the Lord, that God is very powerful, and no one can snatch you out of his hand. Nobody. And that's part of the master's teaching which ties in with his great-grandfather here. And as we look at, and in thy salvation, we're looking at, now we're going to get into praise, worship, adoration, and thanks. That's classification eight here. The playlist number eight is what we're getting into now. As, as the Psalms move on, you start getting more into category number eight. Why is that? Because David's going to start getting into praise more and more. And so, is, so are his buddies. I don't know exactly what the relationship is, uh, the sons of Nun and the sons of Korah, but uh, the, the acknowledging their mothers. But here's my point. The, the, these gentlemen, are. we're going to start getting into praises now, and now we're going to get into category eight, which is David's going to start talking about good things that are happening to him, and the results of getting good things, we have a happy camper. And the happy camper is going to acknowledge the person who gave him the stuff who gave him deliverance over very powerful enemies, who gave him this, who gave him that. And that's what we're getting into right now. And I anticipated this. Well, now we're going to start focusing on number eight. We're on seven now, which is general beauty all over and over again. Now we're going to start infusing number eight and some other categories into these lessons, okay? Making this a... Uh, a real Bible study where we're talking about different concepts. They're not that difficult to understand. I will enumerate them for you. And I have some viewers who have difficulties in school. I know a couple of them or one of them who I think they're still or they're watching some of these videos. And we're here to make everything uh, uh, easy uh, to facilitate these lessons for you. you. You should get this. I don't care if you have difficulty in school or not. Whether you're uh, Whatever you are, in terms of your status as someone who, who has encountered the education and academics, right? Okay. Let's continue. Now, so now we're talking about joy and rejoicing, and we're talking about praise right now. We're talking about happiness. We're talking about being blessed. We're talking about feeling good, and that's what blessed means, essentially. Happy, I feel good and things are favorable. Let's continue. So he is greatly rejoicing. And and, and, and who else said uh, greatly rejoicing? Let, let's turn to, um, let's go to John. Johnny boy, we might say in America. Let's go to John, where he's greatly rejoicing that people are studying the truth, that he started them on the journey of studying the truth. Uh, third epistle, verse 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. The people that he birthed into the kingdom uh, uh, through his ministry, uh, he is rejoicing that these people are walking in righteousness. They're putting on righteous behaviors, they're growing in the grace of God, and they are uh, taking care of business, father's business. They're active, they're learning they're growing, and that's what he sees. That's what John said in the third letter. Now, he's rejoicing and greatly rejoicing in the fact that he saved thy salvation. Now, he, he might be leaning more towards 
the power and strength towards earthly salvation. Remember, there's two basic salvations mentioned in your Bible. There's God saving you and delivering you while you're on the earth. David focuses on that most of the time. But there's also a reference to you being saved in heaven permanently. That's the one the master focuses on the most. Quite obvious. Then when we went to 1715, two chapters back, no, I'm sorry, that's uh, four chapters back, in, in uh, uh, 1715, he talks about what? Being saved permanently with a new body in heaven. So saved also means preserved, translated, moved to a new place. But you're preserved in this new place. So we have two reference points, and that's the only reference points we have. Okay? Number two, thou hast given him the desires, or his heart's desires, and hast not withheld the request of his lips. Selah, think about it. For thou preventest him with the blessings of goodness. Now, we just we, we went through this before. I'm going to go over it again because, <coughs> excuse me, this is germane to the beauty lesson big time. We're, we're, we're hammering home beauty this year, and I want to really focus on that. Now, we just went into a little bit of uh, category eight, which is a, re, a, a good reaction to receiving good. Is that complicated? No, it's not. Now, let's go to verse 3. Now, I remember sharing this with uh, Brother Ray, who is now with the Lord, facing a lot of difficulties in the, 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 the area of hospitals and so forth, which a lot of Christians will, are going to face. God allows us to go through a lot of tribulations. Now, I wanted to point out to him and anyone else, and all of us, that God's going to prevent you, and let's read that, for thou preventest him with the blessings of goodness. Now, this is huge because David's giving you boots on the ground, personal stuff. This is what makes David so powerful, is he gives you a little more personal perspective of being a Christian, more or less, than his son does. His son doesn't give you uh, he gives you a more clinical view of wisdom. Don't do this, and this will happen. Do this, this will happen. David gives you personal, I got this. This is why it's very difficult to go through Psalms and not go through it again. I'm going to go through these 20 or so chapters about 10 times if the Lord tarries, and I'm sitting here. At least 10 times if I live a few more years because this is the center of your Bible because let me share something with you Paul gives you boots on the ground he tells you he went to heaven and he saw beautiful things okay that's boots on the ground however when David gives you boots on the ground it's straight as the young people say it's straight up Paul said, I went to heaven and saw beautiful things that I can't tell you. David tells you, I saw it, and this is what it is. <laughs> that's, that's the difference between these two gentlemen. Paul's a little clinical. He, you know, he, 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 he's, a, he's, a, he's a good businessman. I'm not saying he's inferior to David, but I'm saying he just gives us a different perspective. I saw things that are too beautiful, uh, so that I can't tell you, and all this kind of stuff. David tells you, I got a crown on my head, and I'm happy. Boots on the ground, simple talk. This is why this gentleman is so uh, wonderful. And, of course, we're not saying that he's necessarily wonderful. We're saying the Lord is working through him, and it's wonderful what's happening to him. You get the point? It's wonderful what's happening to him. That's the best way to put it. It is. When you get to Psalm 21, you're, you've, you've arrived conceptually because we're dealing with you getting good stuff and God is going to insist on giving you good stuff 
And that's what he just said. Good. Goodness. He said, Jeremiah, you're right on the beam. Well, I, I am. I'm, I'm not saying I'm bragging. I'm just saying that the word goodness and good are, you, you can overuse those words. You, you, you can wear them out. Uh, however, we're not leaving those words alone. We're um, explaining those words. I'm defining them and I'm giving you examples of what goodness is. We're not saying goodness, goodness. We're saying goodness is the crown that he just got. That's good. Uh, we're, the, one of the things we're going to get into next in this uh, uh, beauty lesson, uh, which I'm going to put under number seven's playlist, I'm going to go over the things in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, which is the same thing right here. The master, the master says he's going to give you good stuff, but there's no reaction from the people who receive the good stuff. He's just telling you, I'm going to give you this, I'm going to give you that. We're not getting a personal reaction. What makes David so profound, so amazing, is he's giving you boots on the ground. This is how this feels. And he did it in chapter 17. Now he's doing it again in chapter 21. Obviously, he's giving you how he feels when he says, I will love the Lord. That's the bottom line of, of the whole Bible. But however, when we get to 1715, we're getting into, he's going to see the beauty of the Lord face to face. And he's giving you uh, boots on the ground. This is how it feels. And you can't beat that. You can read this Bible till the cows come home, and you'll probably never beat 1715. Or you, you, you'll, never, you'll, never do any, you'll never find anything more exciting than 1715. Then he comes back in 21, and, uh, chapter 21, and he does it again. He gives you boots on the ground. We have a beautiful day here. Uh, Wowee, Kazawi. It's kind of like the way I used to feel when I was with, at Disneyland with my parents. And my grandparents were going to see my grandparents later on in the day because they were at the, at the Disney Hotel. I used to live right by Disneyland. I know every inch of Disneyland. When they say it's the happiest place on earth, eh, no, it's not, but it's definitely not a sad place. The happiest place on earth is in church when you're filled with Father Spirit. The happiest place on earth is serving the Lord and getting the, the, the new wine from the Father. The happy wine. Father's river of love. That's the happiest place on earth. However, Disneyland has got a close third place for a young boy to wander around and, and, and have uh, great suckers and rides and, and horses and, and uh, pirates of the Caribbean and, 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 and uh, talking parrots, you know, over there, and another ride, and, and, and Tom Sawyer Island. And, uh, in, a, in a way, it was the happiest place on earth. When I was with my parents at Disneyland, uh, those are some of my fondest memories uh, in my life. Why? Because it was a happy time. It was a blessed time. It doesn't mean that everything in Disneyland is copacetic uh, uh, or acceptable. That's not my point. Okay? Good stuff. I didn't want to leave Disneyland. When we left, I, I, I thought it was too short. I wanted to go back on the monorail. I wanted to I wanted to go see the dinosaurs again. I wanted to go back on the fast ride. I wanted to drive a car. I, I got a chance to drive a car at age 12 on those cars. Okay, listen, and, I, 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 and actually I was very bad at driving. I, I, I did learn how to drive, but boy, I, I, it was one of those things that I was not good at. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an okay driver now, but good things. And for thou preventest him with the blessings of goodness. We're talking about earth beauty right now in reference to uh, Disneyland or, or uh, your parents and, and food and chocolate milk and, and suckers. And, uh, you know, and uh, my grandfather used to take us to Jolly Roger and I got the big giant shrimp 
and it, it was delicious, and my grandparents were there, and my parents were there, and, and it was a done deal for me. I didn't want anything else in life. I never really wanted to leave that posture at all. I, I look back on those times, and the goodness of God came to me, and he stopped me with these blessings, in spite of the fact that I don't deserve them at all. I don't deserve them. And it's good to give thanks to God for things that you have received. It makes the bad times a little bit uh, uh, doable, doesn't it? In many ways, uh, let, let's get back to the lesson, Germain. Thou preventest him with the blessings. So God is going to stop you. He's going to override your uh, uh, plans. That's what prevent means. He's going to stop you. Jeremiah, stop in your tracks. I got something good for you that you don't deserve. Thou preventest him with blessings of goodness. Thou settest a crown of pure gold on his head. I just read to you one of the top 20 scriptures probably in your Bible pertaining to beauty, gifts, happiness. I just gave you one of the top 10, 20 right there. In reference to happiness, joy. If God Almighty puts a crown of gold on your head, Jesus Christ, it doesn't get any better than that. You, you are, you're in the, you're in the now. That's <laughs> your, you know, and, and, and of course, this is the goal of Christianity. That's the goal, you know, that you win this war. You know, that you, you repented, you're baptized, and you're going to fight, and you're going to fight a good fight. And you're going to learn to eschew evil and to practice righteousness and do the good things that God has commanded you to do, such as he told Peter to do that he stopped doing, which was binding up the brokenhearted. He was fishing. The Lord told him, I want you to fish. I want you to be a fisher of men, and I want you to bind up the brokenhearted who come into the church. That's your job. Stick to it. If you love me, you'll do what I told you to do. Because I commanded you to love. If you don't want to do that, we're going to have a problem. God demands that you love. If you don't do that, boots on the ground, there's no success in Christianity. The master said he's going to see people in heaven on his day, and he's going to tell them, I don't know you. The reason why he's going to tell them that he doesn't know them is because he doesn't know them. Because they didn't do love duties. Some of them are even pastors and leaders. He's going to tell them, I don't know you. Because they went through the motions. They, they were there for the money. They, they, they got into sensuality and, and, and things of this nature. And they weren't there to love people and to put their life in a, in a position of denial for the building up of the church. They weren't there for uh, learning to be a servant. They weren't there for that purpose. Therefore, he doesn't know them. The Lord knows servants. He adopts servants. That's why the Lord emphasizes what the most. What does the Lord emphasize the most? What's the body of the letter, Jeremiah? The body of the letter is learn to be the servant. Over and over, a thousand ways to Sunday. That's why when I meet somebody who doesn't emphasize servanthood, I usually will tell them that our fellowship it's going to be strained because you're not teaching the body of the letter. You're hanging on the fringes, you're adding, you're subtracting, and you're prevaricating. 
And it doesn't take a third grader to figure that out, that that's what you are doing. You're taking the commandments of our love about Jesus Christ, and you're hiding them, and you're, you're squeezing them, and you're playing with them, instead of you speaking them plainly and being up front and above board. Okay? It's just that simple. Whether or not you know you're doing that or not is not the point. Some people are doing that, and they're not necessarily aware of that. But as a Bible teacher, that's not my job. That's the Lord's job. My job is to, to, to use the Bible as my guide as to how to assess people. And for those of you who are following along with me, you're going to have that capacity too as you go along. You'll test the spirits. You'll do as the Bereans did in the, in the, in the book of Acts. You'll test what people say according to the word of God. If it's not in line, see ya. Get in line, we can have fellowship. It's just that complicated. I'm going to shut down here. We left off on a very, very poignant, serious part of your Bible. Because this is, this is the big deal. The big deal is for you to be in heaven and receive a crown from the master that you did indeed go into the church. You did indeed love the brethren. You put on the mind of denial and sacrifice for the building up and the, the binding up of the brokenhearted instead of going to the basketball game and, and, and you picked what team to join. You join the denial team. You picked the team that declared that they were going to take up their cross and follow him. That's the crowd you joined. And, and, there's, and there's a crown for the cross. It's just that simple. And we teach denial here. We teach uh, deny yourself. Take up your cross and deny yourself. That's what the master said. It may not be very popular uh, when I go to the gym and so forth, but that has nothing really to do with me. Let him, let him take up his cross. If any man come after him, come after me, let him, allow him. That's what that means, allow him. That goes right back to principle number six, which is what, Jeremiah? Wisdom, volition, and yield. Wisdom is making the right decision to become a servant in the church by the option that you have, which we have the profound statement of Mr. David here, 18, right here, near where we are, in proximity. I will love thee. There you go. We're here to learn to love the Lord and by our will. Okay? And that's, and that's exercised by a yield. Y-I-E-L-D. 